Hello everybody, this is Ted Gothier with Michigan CNC Webinars. We try to do an online webinar the first Tuesday of every month, uh, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Tonight's uh, meeting has been adjusted a little bit, and we adjust the meeting every once in a while when we have a holiday or a conflict in the schedules. But if you're on our notification list, and you can be placed on the notification list, by sending me a private email at tgothier at comcast.net and request that you be placed on the notification list. And then I'll send out, when I send out the emails for anyone that's on the list, announcing that we're going to have a webinar, you'll be notified. Typically, if you're on the notification list, more than likely you will only receive maybe two emails a month. We don't share the emails with anybody. Um, the webinars are 100% free. They don't cost anyone anything. Um, we just try to do it for our own recreational and educational knowledge. So I try to send out a notification the week before the meeting and the day of as a reminder so that you'll be able to be aware of when we're going to have our next webinar. Tonight, we have a fellow named Mike Marshall from Marshall CNC and Woodworking. Uh, he's based out of Illinois, and he's a pretty creative guy. Uh, he's done many things on his CNC, and a lot of people on Facebook have commented how nice his work is. And so I contacted Mike, and he graciously volunteered to um, come and talk to us um, about some of the things that he does. So I'm going to go ahead and pass the presentation role over to uh, Mike and, um, and then let him go ahead and, and run with it. And we'll see his screen. And I hope you guys enjoy it. If you um, are um, first time here, we like to see that you take your mic and put it on silence, turn your mic off. But if you have a question throughout the presentation, feel free to turn your microphone on and ask any question. We kind of encourage that. And um, also, don't forget to make your screen in the large area. You know, sometimes your screen's minimized. If you enlarge it, then you'll have a full screen of the video. So welcome, Mike. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, coming on. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks. Um, first, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Marshall. I'm from Sullivan, Illinois, which is uh, in the central part of Illinois. And uh, can everybody hear me okay? Or yeah, okay. Uh, first time doing this, so kind of nervous at the same time. It, it was like preparing a speech for college with a slideshow and all that stuff, but um, I try to get out as, as much as I can online as far as uh, my first uh, picture here. I'm on Facebook in a couple of different places, Instagram. I have an Etsy store. Uh, I have a small uh, YouTube channel uh, with some videos on there, and I'm hoping to do some more. And I also have a Pinterest account where I, I post my projects. Um, I'm fairly new to CNC. I've only been doing it for two years. Uh, I bought my first one in March of 2017, which was a uh, small 6040Z Chinese uh I think now I call it a starter CNC. This was about 1500 bucks, and I was trying to get my feet wet, uh, trying to learn how to do all this stuff, and picked up fairly quickly. Uh, was pretty successful, so it ended up being where I was limited on the size of stuff that I could do. So. Uh, March of 2018, something about March, it's March now, um, I bought my second machine, which is a Probotics Meteor, 
And this is a uh, cut size, I think 25 by 50. And so far I haven't outgrown it. Uh, I think we all want a four by eight or larger machine, but this is what I've got room for, for now. Um, I like both of them. I, I use both of them still. Uh, I run both of them at the same time, occasionally. And uh, besides, hang on a second, I'm trying to keep track of people joining the group. Um, so just a little bit of I guess I've seen the CMO for two years. Uh, before that, I was a finisher for the Amish community. I live in a uh, Amish woodworking community, community, and there's a lot of kitchen cabinets being made, uh, Amish furniture, heirloom quality furniture. Uh, so I started out in a woodworking shop as a, a builder and a finisher uh, from the beginning of the process clear through top coat and everything in between. Uh, from there, I went and started a, a job at Eastern Illinois University uh, doing something else, and woodworking was always um, part of something that, that I've done. And during the layoff, I, I ended up getting laid off because of the um, state budget is when I bought that first machine. And so, Thankfully, due to that layoff, I got into CNC or, or that would have never happened. Um, so at the same time, I went back to work at a custom cabinet shop, a uh, high-end cabinet shop, and from there was stolen from another custom cabinet shop. And both of those, both of those cabinet shops, I was the finished supervisor, uh, for the entire finished department uh, due to my experience and, and my history with uh, finishing. And then from there, I was stolen <laughs> from that shop to a better shop and uh, more money back to the custom Amish furniture. Um, so I've worked in three or four different finished shops being in charge of all of those. Um, so I, I do have a, a large finishing uh, background. So I have a lot to offer when it comes to finishing products uh, as well as making them. Um, so since I worked at all those shops, when I left, uh, I have a a good network of people the owners of those shops that still give me material, uh, like you see in this picture, this is out of one week that I can go each week and pick up this amount of material free for me that they're going to burn. And uh, since I got along with them, I left on good terms. Instead of burning it, they give it to me to make money on. Um, there's nothing wrong with these uh, cabinet doors, they're all either the wrong size, the wrong shade of stain that didn't match the rest of the job. Um, so I do get free material, which for me um, is different than a lot of other people that have to buy their material, uh, finish it out. I'm getting some feedback from somewhere. Um, so that's uh, from one week at a cabinet shop that I, I have hundreds, literally hundreds of these doors at home now. Um, and I kind of plan on what I'm going to put on them based on the piece itself and the color. Here's another image of uh, some large doors. These are four foot tall. Um, a lot of times I'll turn these sideways landscape and uh, figure out something I'm going to cut into them. Um, so since this is an Amish community, we have uh, a local Amish mill 
less than five miles from my house. And these panels I actually buy. The good thing for me is I don't have to glue up my own wood panels. I uh, email them my order, whatever size, whatever uh, species. And in two weeks, my order is ready to pick up. So they uh, glue my panels up. I order them not cut to size so that they're a little bit bigger both ways, uh, length and width. I'm getting more material if they don't cut them to size. And it's cheaper if they don't have to. Uh, they time save both sides, uh, which is sanded on both sides. It's ready for finish when I get it. Uh, so I order. Uh, whatever thickness I want and don't have to go through the hassle of uh, gluing and clamping, uh, planing, none of that stuff. And it's less than five miles from my house. So I live in a good area for me to be in this um, side business part time uh, to be able to make extra money. Uh, another picture of the stack. Uh, around here, we we make a lot of furniture out of uh, character cherry, which is naughty cherry. It's imperfect cherry. It has knot holes in it. I actually like to look better than cherry. It's uh, cheaper. It's about half the price of clean cherry. And I make a lot of stuff out of uh, the character cherry, especially flags uh, and other signs. Uh, I'm starting to do more epoxy fills in the uh, character, and I'll have more of those coming up uh, within the next couple of months. I, I have some panels done, but I haven't cut anything into them yet. Uh, and I do, the only thing that I buy from big box stores is are these pine panels. Uh, I don't do a lot of pine, but I think this board. Uh, at four feet by 18, I believe, was 11 or $12, and it's a half inch thick. I only bought it just because this design was actually by Dan Ingram in, in one of the groups, and uh, it was a cheap piece of wood that by carving it and finishing it in a certain way, I can turn around and get 10 times my money. Uh, on the sale. So on this particular piece here, uh, since it was pine, I went ahead and uh, torched it and also painted it black down in the cut. And then the red on the stripes is actually a custom mixed stain that I use. And uh, so there's three or four different processes on just to get this look, a, a little bit of mixture of everything. And then the other um, Big box thing that I buy are these 24 inch rounds from Home Depot. These are nine dollars. They're one inch thick, uh, routed around the edge. And so for nine dollars, I can do this design and these sell for a hundred dollars. So I'm getting ten times my money. Um, and I like the, the uh, torch pine look. Uh, I also know. Uh, a guy, a countertop installer that has uh, plenty of Corian, half inch hard surface or solid surface material, uh, cuts like butter, hard, um, waterproof. So I make uh, quite a bit of stuff out of Corian. I'm sure many of you have seen it or maybe cut it. I like the surface. It comes in a lot of different uh, colors. So just some neat things to make out of something other than wood and metal. Uh, I don't do metal just because I don't want it in my dust collection. Uh, I put this in here because this was one of the first five pieces that I did starting two years ago. And uh, I think I've come a long way since this regular um, engraving and pocketing method. Back then, I used CAMBAM, which was a free program. Uh, I ended up buying the the actual product for 140 bucks. I couldn't afford B-Carb Pro or Aspire. 
Um, but Cam Bam got me through um, a year for me to be able to save up for V Car Pro, uh, which completely changed my CNC life. Um, this next one, so this is my my very first project, one of the first five, and this is my latest that I finished last week. Uh, and I'll come back to this later on, uh, but this is a 3D wavy flag. And what I did was laminated a three quarter character cherry board on a three quarter soft maple board and then uh, cut the 3D uh, waves into it and be carved the flag into it. This is one of my favorite pieces and Unfortunately, it's one that I made and I'm not going to sell because I like it too much. It's going right here in my home office. So one thing with the uh, material that I get from the cabinet shops is I, I'm throwing this in here because if you're doing it like me part time for uh, extra income, if you have a place around you that um, you can go to for a cabinet doors, maybe a habitat for a humanity store that has doors or things like this, where you can get the material either for free or at a very low cost. These are money makers. Uh, this is a master door from one of the cabinet shops. It's 15 and a half by 11 and a half. And I, I have over a hundred of these doors, different colors. Um, Stain, paint, shadow line, glaze. Uh, a lot of these I did while I was there. Um, but these are very good money makers. And for free material, right, or for this one, I can turn around and sell this for $25 to $30. And the actual cut itself took two and a half minutes. And so the only thing I had to do was I cut for two and a half minutes, I seal sanded it and re top coat and it was done. Another one, same thing, two and a half, three minutes. And what I do is uh, for my design, I'll, I'll look at the door or the material that I have and I center everything on the center datum. So if I have this DXF right here, I will measure that center panel which is about eight inches, uh, four and a half inches tall. And I'll, I'll leave a little bit on each side and scale it to that. And then when I center my X and Y in the center of the door, it comes out spaced uh, perfectly inside that panel. Uh, these are, a lot of these are top sellers and they sell very fast. I put this one in here to show um, how clean the paint job is, which came from the uh, cabinet shop that way. But once I cut it, the shops that I've worked with in the past allow me to bring in a stack of my uh, finished products. I seal sand them here at home. Um, they allow me to come in. Uh, whenever I want and spray this stuff. So I make stuff for them for free. I pay them a little bit on the side for the top coat, but I can go in uh, the shops that I used to work at and spray this stuff myself. Uh, I get a lot of compliments on the spray or my finish. And what I use just like um, they do is a conversion varnish with a catalyst. And this is used on kitchen cabinets, furniture. It's a uh, 35 degree sheen. Sometimes it's a five or a 10 degree sheen for a duller finish. Um, let's see. I do a lot of these for weddings, wedding gifts. They're fast sellers. Um, how do you how do you color the uh, v carved part after go to the previous slide. Uh, it was a white door, 
how did you get that gold, golden color in there without disturbing the white? Okay. Um, it's a secret, but I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Very okay. good. Okay, so uh, at the cabinet shop, all painted through the shops, all the ones I've worked at, the fr the wooden frame is made out of soft maple because it's a cheaper wood for them to make with. And then this particular center panel is MDF. Since it's going to be painted, they don't want to use soft maple. MDF is cheaper and it's smoother for a finish. So all painted doors are, uh, they always did a an MDF center panel. So this this was a solid white door. When you cut it, the MDF is a little bit lighter, like regular MDF. And then when you hit it with the conversion varnish, it darkens that MDF just a little bit. Okay. So if it's a stained, um, stained or painted, this one is a, another painted door. Uh, again, MDF center, and it was uh, shaped in the molder. Uh, these cabinet shops that I worked at made their own doors with, so they shape everything themselves, uh, the inside profile, outside profile. Uh, again, this was MDF, so with the rub through on this one, since the frame is wooden, after they, they paint it black, they rub through the black and then they take a light stain and stain the raw part of the wood on the frame. I could have done that the same with the MDF in the center like they did in the corners of the MDF uh, center, but it would have been too dark, I think, so I just left a regular MDF, and then when I respray it, it turns into gold color, which is kind of neat because when you have white or black with gold, it's just natural MDF sprayed. So these make great gifts. I mean, this one here is 20 uh, by 21 and a half, I think, tall. It's a it's a good size door, and they make great um, great gifts for people to buy for other people. Um, you know, I, I turned around and sold this one right here for forty five dollars. It was um, free material for one. Um, but it, it took about 20 minutes to cut and I sprayed it a couple of dollars for a top coat to the shop and sold it for $45. Um, so I get a lot of drawer fronts, which are long. This is, uh, 38 and a half inches long. Not a lot you can do with uh, long skinny drawer fronts, but like I said, I look at the I look at the material, and then I kind of figure out what I want to put in there. Um, just a good example of uh, what you can do with free material, and even the smallest, skinniest pieces, you can find something to make and make money on. Here's another one. Uh, this guy actually wanted gold letters, so it turned out great for the. Uh, MDF. This was a, a mirror frame, same thing from the cabinet shop, free. Uh, I had some old mirrors sitting around, cut up the mirror. Uh, I ran the top and bottom rail individually and then used my diamond drag bit on the mirror. So it kind of coincided with each other. Um, just something my daughter and I come up with, uh, something to make with the mirror frame. Um, so instead of just leaving the mirror plain, uh, it's just kind of a thing that goes together. When you did the mirror um, with the drag bit, did you run the drag bit on the mirror or on the back side? I, I had to run it on the front. Okay. Yeah. Good. I think if you do it on the back side of a mirror, it will take away your uh, mirror, uh, the reflection off the back. 
So I just, things like this, I try to come up with a wow factor. If, if I have material sitting around, uh, I try to think of something that to make that when someone sees it, they will say, hey, I want that. And it works. Um, or I, you know, I found that it works. Uh, I threw this one in because this was a plain white door. And with my finishing background, we did a lot of tinking. And some of you may have heard of it, some may not. Uh, tinking is a process where you uh, spray on a either a wet glaze or a dry glaze, and then you take off everything except for what you want left there. Um, I tink this one at home which it wasn't actually tinking, but it has the same effect. So this was a plain white door, MDF center panel, which would have been gold if I would have left it. So what I did was took this, this white door and I soaked a rag in gray stain and I stained it like I was gonna stain any other piece. And then I wiped off all the stain, let it dry up a little bit. And then I took a steel sanding sponge and then sanded off everything except for what you see here. It left a shadow line. It left a, a wet glaze look in the corners. Uh, it left uh, some stuff around the edges. And then when you top coat over that, it's sealed on there. So I try to use, use my imagination on, instead of just using like a couple pictures ago where it would have been an all white, pure white door with gold lettering, uh, throw some stain on this white and rub it off and then leave a little bit on there. I think it turned out awesome. And not everybody likes that look. Uh, I do, you know, for certain things, uh, but we've done a lot of kitchen, full kitchens that were tinked. And here's, a, here's another one. This was an all white, same thing. Um, I think this was actual soft maple, but I went ahead and stained down inside the cut and uh, stained the rest of the door and then rubbed it off, seal sanded off and top coated. I think it's a good, good effect on some things. And then everybody knows that, um, you know, if, Depending on the look that you're going for, this is a big piece of ash, and this is a dark gray, kind of greenish hunting color. So I just came up with uh, this sign. This was for someone's wedding, and uh, mainly just left the cut alone. It, it's uh, like a white wood, so I had a good contrast. And... Uh, Okay, so this one, I came up with this design. This is on a piece of actual uh, character cherry. I've got a couple of these, but uh, one is black and one is white. So before I started using um, Aura Mask, this is how I used to do it. This was on a piece of cherry and, and this was all spray painted black. And then my son is a self-proclaimed artist uh, that started doing uh, airbrushing. So we came up with this idea. He put, he also plays guitar in a couple bands. So he wanted to airbrush this and I had turned him loose on it. And he started airbrushing. Uh, he wanted this one just all black and white. Uh, and you can see using a fine tip instead of a spray can, you can highlight what you want. And then we sanded the face off to to go back to a natural cherry panel. And that's what we ended up with. So on the reverse of that, again, we painted this one white. And instead of doing black and white, he wanted to use some color. And he taped off different areas and painted different colors based on the flow of the design and this took him a little while because he had to wait for you know the paint to dry where he painted and then move the tape and all that other stuff and then we sanded it back down to natural cherry to come up with that so 
we're always trying to make the wow factor and come up with different finishing techniques instead of just a black and white uh, standard, what we always go with, um, and just make people want the piece instead of making a piece hoping somebody wants to buy it down the road. Uh, let's see. Uh, this was a piece of MDF uh, that this, I think was his first airbrush uh, experience and he had just got it. So I just, I made a simple cut. I think this took five or six minutes and he ended up turning into that. This is more for his his personal room. Um, I do a lot of design, so I get asked to make certain things, not even off of a picture really. This, this uh, license plate is to scale off of a guy's Corvette and um, he wanted it for his man cave, so I kind of, came up with the size and dimensions and Googled the image of Lincoln and created the vectors and went from there and uh, turned out pretty good. But that's just to scale. Um, this is how I used to do my painting down in the cut before or a mask, basically spray painting and sanding it off. Uh, a lot of us probably have done that, probably still do, I do on some things. But by doing this, uh, this way, if you have to sand too hard, depending on your wood, such as pine, the softer woods, you can easily sand off your uh, small detailed lines. So I, most of the time I use Aura Mask, Aura Mask now, um, but this is the way I started out. It works great. Um, but here, starting from the bottom, um, some people may not have used Aura Mask in the past, but this is how it works. You you put it on a clean board. Uh, I squeegee it down with a piece of plastic or a piece of rubber so there's no air bubbles in it. Uh, I make the cut, I spray paint it, and then you peel it off right here. And then uh, there's very minimal sanding and then you just top coat it, or seal and top coat. Easy way to finish. Um, I do design a lot of stuff. I have an Etsy store, and this is one of them that I've I've had. I, I get a lot of compliments on the, the vector for the Eagle Globe and Anchor. I'm a Marine myself. Uh, I do have a license to sell these through the Marine Corps. Um, just a union I made for for my own office, and it does have black edges around the the side, which you can't see. But uh, I used Aura Mask on this and finished my edges before I paint them. And then when I peel the Aura Mask off, I just need to uh, sand the face, seal and top coat. Uh, this I just finished a couple weeks ago. This is from my brother's. Uh, shop that he manages and works at same place i used to uh, run the uh, finish department he runs the wood shop uh, so this is 24 by 20 uh, 20 inches tall uh, it's just a simple v-carve quarter inch deep and turned out great i finished the edges before i painted them so the edges are black and uh turned out nice uh, i don't always try to make signs i try to make some other things uh, i came up with this design made it as a sign actually first and then i ended up splitting it in two mirroring it and uh making the <clears throat> excuse me tool pass to where i can cut out and then i make bookends out of it. I have a couple different ones, different kinds of guitars. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is the design I came up with. Since my son plays guitar, he wanted a 3D uh, model of a 
Les Paul. This was our trial run. This was only on a three quarter inch board. But you can see here, this is a uh, character cherry. This is why I like it. I positioned this piece so that this knot hole would be uh, on the body, but not interfere with the other parts of the guitar. So by getting these panels, uh, character cherry, I can kind of place my design wherever I want for the final outcome. So uh, being from finish, I try to always think of the end result first before I even start any project, how I want it to look. Uh, one thing I found out is that you can take a decent project and make a a good project with a, a good finish, but you can also take an outstanding piece of uh, work and ruin it with finish. So I always try to think of the final outcome on you know what I want to achieve before I even start. This was a, a good example. These are just a couple signs. Uh, this is character cherry. This one's soft maple. Uh, one's stain only, and the other is paint and natural cherry. Uh, here's why I get into some of my flags. Most of these are 12 inches tall by 22 inches wide. This is uh, soft maple, all stain, no paint. Uh, I just threw a couple of them in here to show different finishes, different woods. Uh, this one's actually uh, character cherry, I believe. This one's cherry, but one thing I started doing was you could see from the, the previous pictures, the difference between this picture and this one here is lighting and your background. Uh, for me, presenting it online or trying to sell it or however, I tried to put uh, a black background behind it. So I went and bought a fairly good sized piece of black felt. I also have a maroon colored one and I try to block out all the background noise from my piece and then I try to get good lighting and a good angle to show uh, the shine and cleanliness of just a nice satin finish. No blemishes. So these were a couple of them that I thought turned out really well. I get a lot of compliments on the finish. This is uh, this one's soft maple right here. Um, this is my Marine Corps squadron. I actually made this vector of the of the jet. This is my squadron jet and my squadron patch. And I've got several people that I served with that that I'm making these for, so that's kind of exciting. This is one of my top sellers, uh, this design on my Etsy store. And you, some of you may have seen it or bought it. Uh, this is my tattered flag. This is a distressed soft maple and with raised stars. And so what I how I make these finish wise is first I cut it and I've got a video on my YouTube channel on on how uh, the different nine steps it takes to make one flag. So first I cut it with just uh, two end mills. And then I distress it with a hand plane. Uh, I cut slits in it right here for splitting with a razor knife. I stab it for some wormholes, and then I torch it. Then after I torch it, I sand just the face off to make it white again. And then I stain the whole thing. And then I sand the face off again because the stain grabs everything that the torch did not. So all this white stuff uh, is now covered up with the stain. And then I sand 
the face off again and it leaves all the torched and stain marks down in the distressed part and then I seal and top coat it. And this is the result. What I like about these flags is that they're all different. There's not one that's the same. It's just a random tearing them up and making them look good. Um, for my 3D flags, these are the bits that I use to make the waves. And Chet Weatherall, who was a speaker, I think, two months ago, um, him and I have worked together over the phone and, and online. He got me using these for the waves. Uh, for my designs that I sell, I set up the, the tool path for the roughing with a quarter inch ball nose and then the finish path with an eighth inch ball nose. What I actually use, because not everybody has the size of tools, um, for the roughing, I use one and a half inch cove bit with a 10% step over for the roughing, and then for the finish, I use a one inch with a 6% step over. This is a two inch and I don't use it very often. Um, but here's the difference. With a quarter inch ball nose, the design says it takes four and a half hours for the roughing pass. With this bit right here, an inch and a half, that same speed, feed, everything, takes 45 minutes. So you're talking a difference of four and a half hours or 45 minutes for the same result. And then same thing with the finish pass. It's a lot faster um, with a bigger tool. I usually run between 150 and 180 inches per minute with these, but the uh, router is only going 15,000 probably. With the, with the larger tools. So with these, this is Character Cherry, again with the knot hole. And uh, again, these are 12 by 23. And I use a roughing pass, a finish pass, and then a V carve of a DXF laid on top of those uh, waves that, on top of the 3D model. So as long as the tab or as long as the checkbox for project onto 3D model for the V carve is checked, it will follow that DXF will follow those waves. Did you raster that along the X axis? Um yes. Yeah. Um I always tell people if you turn, depending on your machine, if you turn it to raster it on the Y, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't do the raster by Z often at all. This is, uh, I think it's faster and, and better to go with your axis, either X or Y, however it's turned, um, especially for the, stripes with an eighth inch end mill. I don't like doing the offset because you get tool marks in there, or that's been my experience. Uh, tool marks working from the inside out. I like rastering the uh, V-carve with, with the end mill. Uh, here's another one, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I made for my brother. Um, Again, it's just I can put any any DXF flag design that I create onto the 3D model of the flags and and have it follow the waves. Uh, a lot of us, and I will agree, have seen that the flag market. Some people are getting tired of seeing flags all over the place, me included, because I design them every day. Um, it's a saturated market, but it's it's always there. Um, I, 
I make a lot of them, but I try to make other stuff as well. <clears throat> Again, this is the one I just finished last week. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to get a drink. What's the Roman numeral three? It's three percenter. It's a uh, three percent. You'll have to look it up the official Google um, definition of three percenter. Uh, the small group of the population that stands out from the rest to make sure the I don't want to get this wrong. Um, like military, uh, police would be 3%. You know what I mean? Something like that. You'd have to look up the, the actual Google. <clears throat> I just get, I get asked to design a lot of these flags. And so I've got, I think, 480 designs. It's a rigid, translucent, stenciling vinyl formula. Someone has their microphone on. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Okay, I'll just move on. Uh, so this was the beginning process of that. It shows the lamination. And I, what I wanted to do was the model height for the, those waves were set at three quarters of an inch. So to get down into the second board of three quarters, I, I started the model a quarter inch below the surface of the first board to make sure that the uh, second board came through. And there you can see, uh, that's after a couple passes, I think. Here it's V carving the flag on the waves. And just a different view of how the different woods go into the next uh, throughout the design. I've actually looked at this flag several times and I see even it's a small piece, 12 by 23, there's a lot going on in the design itself. Um, here it cut away the, the cherry as it went down an eighth inch um, just from this point over to here. Uh, took the cherry away, and uh, just throughout the letters, the stars, uh, here there's some difference because there's an eighth inch difference between uh, the regular surface and the stripe itself, so it's kind of neat how the whole thing turned out. It was my first run on doing uh, the 3D wavy flag on a laminated piece, and I like it, so I think what I'm going to do Next time is probably walnut on soft maple, um, and then try some different ones from there. Um, so I had some, uh, I always have questions on tips through VCarve. Some, a lot of you guys may use this, some may not. Uh, as well as a program itself. If you do, uh, I just had a couple of things that I was going to touch on the way I get my flags or any design to turn out. Uh, this one is an, just an A10 on a flag, but <clears throat> you can tell that these are real thin vector lines close together. And to get these to turn out, a good way to get these to turn out is to uh, I select the image itself by instead of the whole flag, and I try to do a separate um, tool path for it. So by selecting that, right here is what I use a lot for real thin lines. So I want the total depth at 0 0.1 of an inch, and for the real thin ones, I will start a depth of 0 0.01 and make the flat depth 0 0.09. And what that does is it starts at just that much below the surface of the board, and you end up with this, which turns out good. 
And the next one is when I change it with no start depth at the point one, same bit and everything. And you can see that it doesn't come out as clear. It's not going down far enough. So I'm going to back up one again. And you can see that just by starting it 0 0.01 below the surface, you end up getting a better image on your cut than if you were just to leave the, the start depth at the surface. I get asked that all the time is, um, you know, somebody will put, I want this at 0 0.125 and it's not coming out, it's coming out like this. So for that example, 0 0.125, your start depth would be 0 0.01 and then your flat depth would be 0 0.115. And that equals 0.125. So again, if somebody uh, has problems with real thin lines coming out, uh, maybe this will help you is to uh, have a start depth of 0 0.01 and then make up your difference on the flat depth. Now, if you have a start depth of 0 0.01 and you keep your flat depth at point one two five your entire depth is going to be point one three five so if you adjust the start depth they have to adjust your flat depth and okay now here's a four different ways to get this um uh, say one image to get four different results by selecting the outside lines of the the image. Uh, some people want raised stars, but an inset logo, uh, raised star, raised logo. And, and I think some of the newer uh, beginners don't realize that V-carving works from the outside selected vector inward. So the last or the outside line that's selected, V-Carve will um, start carving immediately inside that and then every other area working its way in. So I tried to come up with, uh, so it doesn't take down my, or freeze up my computer, I just did some screenshots. So this is all gonna be the same image of this flag and for an inset star and an inset logo, even though this line, this red line is in uh, in the design itself, you can de deselect that and it will change the way this comes out. So this flag will be an inset star, inset logo shown on this next screen. Okay, and so if you go back and you select that line that was red, now that's included in all of it. You're going to have inset star and a raised logo. Now, if you select the borderline, everything that's on the page, you'll end up having raised stars because the V-car will start cutting immediately inside the first line. And an inset logo because this line right here is selected as well, which is that. And then if you select everything except for this red line, then you you should have raised stars and a raised logo. So just with one image, depending on what vector lines are selected, working from the outside in, there was four different ways just by select or deselecting lines immediately outside of what you're wanting to raise or inset, you get uh, different results. So I'm going to flip back through these real quick just for um, just these four pictures here. Um, you can see the difference on the logos themselves as well as the stars.
So I try to tell people if you need to, if something's inset and you want it raised, either deselect the line right outside of what you're want, wanting raised or add an offset line just outside of that line that you're wanting raised. And it changes everything. But I learn every day and it's the good thing about VCAR Pro or Aspire is the preview. And I tell people all the time, preview, preview until it looks perfect uh, because the way it previews is the way it's going to cut. And if something doesn't look right on the preview, then uh, you don't have to waste your board material or whatever. You don't have to waste that hoping that something turns out right. And that's all I that's all I could come up with. I got a question right away. Sure. On the slide that you started with and finished with. <clears throat> the lower right uh shield thing, what wood is that? It is soft maple. It's seven eighths uh seven eighths thick soft maple. And, and what use as the stain to give it that almost mahogany look. Um, that is a custom mix stain that I made myself uh, in the shop that I used to work at. It's not something um, you can buy, not a color you can buy. Um, one thing I did as the finished supervisor was did all the custom uh, stains and custom paints um, from scratch. We had um, certain chemicals and dyes, and this is one I came up with for uh, mainly soft maple and cherry. It looks great on both, and I do all of my, um, most of my dark stained are, are in this color, and I get asked that a lot. There's nothing that I can even give you a color reference to to maybe buy something close to that color. It's 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 down to the hundred thousandth of a decimal on dropping a dye in a gallon. You know what I mean? It looks stunning, and it looks almost uh, old, uh, old European mahogany like. I, I I love that piece. I I did that for a classmate of mine. I graduated with. Uh, he gave me the Google image of the three dogs and this is what I came up with and uh <clears throat> he was so happy with it that we we agreed on a price and this is actually 16 by 16 but uh and 7 eighths thick to give it some beef but he was so happy with it that he gave me a hundred dollar tip over the amount so great talk you did a good job very interesting thank you thank you Yes, I think the uh, presentation tonight was uh, beyond outstanding. Uh, it really shows how prepared you were, and uh, I certainly learned an awful lot, and I think others did too. It was very informative, and uh, we really enjoyed having you uh, present tonight. And uh, like to uh, open it up just for a minute or two, just to see if anybody uh, has any questions before we close out the evening. Anybody have any questions there? Um, if no one has any questions, I just want to personally thank Mike Marshall from Marshall CNC and Woodworking for this presentation tonight. I think it was outstanding. I think we had learned a lot of tips tonight, and um, we're very fortunate to have uh, you uh, share some of your knowledge and uh, techniques with us. Uh, uh, we're really grateful for it, and we appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to share share everything that you uh, have learned the last couple of years. I mean, uh, some of the uh, projects that you have here look like uh, you've been doing this for years and years. So uh, it gives us a lot of us hope that uh, are getting new into CNC to be able to uh, aspire to uh, reach some of your levels. But uh, Thank you. You know, the one thing that you did not mention that I would like to ask you was you had mentioned several times that you have an Etsy shop. Yeah. Uh, feel free to uh, let us know how we could 
um, find you on Etsy, and um, I know you sell your projects on Etsy, but do you also sell CNC files? Actually, I, I don't. Um, I don't sell projects on Etsy because I would be overwhelmed. I only sell CNC files uh, right now. So, uh, like I said, I have about 480 files. Uh, anything, anything from flags to hunting stuff. Um, if you if you search, if you go to Etsy.com and then search Marshall CNC, I'll I'll pop up there and you can. Uh, go through uh, that those pages. Right now, I usually run 20% off on uh, the designs and stuff. I try to be fair um, for the cost. I, I have a lot of people that come back and buy stuff on a regular basis. Uh, I had a lady buy uh, 35 files from me last night. Um, so I'm grateful for the people that come back and. Uh, by the files that I've already created, but I also take uh, requests and and special uh, designs. So I do design for people through the Etsy, and you know if they want something on a flag, I'll I'll design it for them. And and uh, I'm pretty good at at uh, creating vector files out of um, images and photographs and things like that. When I'm, one thing I'm trying to get better at is 3D modeling. I'm not there yet, not even close to, you know, some of these guys that build 3D models, but that's my goal for the year is to become better at building 3D models and offering those for sale. Now, um, do all of your files run about the same price or is there a big range of what the cost of your files? Uh, and, and and on top of that, the other thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, what are the expectations of the guys using the files? Uh, when they buy a file from you, do you want them to just use it for their own personal use, or are they free to take that and make something and sell it? No, I want people to be able to take those and make money off of them. So what I try to tell people is, uh, well, first of all, the like a, a regular flag DXF is normally ten dollars but i normally run twenty percent off which is eight dollars uh, that eight dollar one-time purchase can turn into hundreds or thousands for that uh, person making the flags um, some of the smaller easier files might be five dollars i have some on there for two dollars four dollars uh, now the 3d wavy flag our actual CRV files, they come with the tool pass already set. Um, those initially are $20, but again, they're normally 20% off, which is $16. And again, um, you know, I buy files from people, uh, 3D file or 3D models from people um, for 20, 30 bucks. And I think that that 20, $30 one-time fee for me when I make it and sell it was worth the money. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to keep it fair on what I would pay for the same thing. Um, with with all of the DXF, say, flags, they automatically get a DXF, a couple SVGs, and depending on the software they're using, they get the how-to um, on how I do my flags. And... Uh, Again, the CRVs are are ready to go. It's got the model built into it. They can, uh, if you know what you're doing, you can edit some of those files yourself. And yeah. Okay, and then um, uh, I was very impressed with how you had taken just a plain uh, drawer front or a door and put a saying in that. Um, are those sayings uh, for sale? So that someone wouldn't have to go on out and try to find that type style in that saying. They could just go to your Etsy store and buy that saying and then put it on their own door. Well, there's two things. Um, some of the ones with the regular fonts, uh, you, you should be able to create them yourself. Um, but but I, the, ones the one that I was uh, particularly uh, trying to use as a, maybe an example was the starfish. 
you have some real fancy writing, and it's all compiled in the shape of a starfish. Now, right. you could do that yourself, but you have to go on out and find the type style, and then you have to actually massage it to be that shape. And if you've already got that done, I personally, I think, you know, hey, if someone was going to, you know, go buy it, I think it would be well worth, you know, the sure. time. Yeah. And I didn't yeah. know if that was you sold. Right. So uh, some of the regular fonts I don't do, but some of the ones with the swirly ends and where they taper out, the starfish, things like that, uh, I do have some of those on there. Those are a work in product or progress. I do have all of the DXFs uh, for that stuff, but unfortunately, I can only move so fast on getting uh, the files uploaded. So I do have people uh, message me all the time and say, hey, I saw this, such as the starfish. Do you have that file for sale? And at that point, I'll say, yeah. I'll upload it and then you can get it from there. Uh, so I, I've been doing them as people request them, but I've got hundreds of those things and it, they keep me busy designing flags and all this other stuff that I, it's hard for me to sit and just upload files all the time. So yeah. I, so just I request do, it if you have something in mind. Yeah. I, I do, do have a list. I have a list that I work off of on on requested stuff and you know on my list is sayings that I need to get all those things uploaded uh, because those are easy sellers and they take minutes to be carve yeah so, I, it's, it's not uncommon that one of us uh, I speak for myself but I'm sure I'm speaking for others that you know at the last minute you've got to go to a housewarming or someone invites you over and you want to take them something but you just thought about it in the morning and you're going in the evening and wow, you could throw something together, you yeah. know, or even, you know, within a week away, you could throw something together really quick. Well, what I found out also is um, a lot of those sayings are not only popular in CNC, but I have cricket users. I have vinyl cutter users that are also buying those files to be able to make that, um, make those texts. Like I said, on a CNC, um, most of those sayings won't take you more than say five or 10 minutes at the most for a big one. Mm -hmm. So if you have material that you can get at a restore or an old cabinet door or driving by a, a, a stack of stuff out by the curb, uh, if you can get the material for nothing and carve it in five or 10 minutes and make, you know, 20, 30 bucks on it, that's that's what I do. So, yeah. fabulous, great ideas. Anybody else have questions before we before we close out tonight? Okay, well, I'd like to uh, say thank you once again, Mike. We appreciate it. Did a great job, very informative, and I hope everybody has a wonderful week. Um, I just want to make two comments. One is that this video was recorded, and I will try to post it to YouTube. And you can see on the screen, Michigan CNC webinars and tips is what you'll need to search on YouTube. You'll be able to uh, uh, see this uh, video in its whole, the webinar and in, in the entire uh, video in itself. Uh, the next thing is no webinar in April because this was the April webinar. And the next one will be the first Tuesday in May, which will be May 7th. And our topic is how to automate your CNC. So hope everybody has a great week and month and uh, enjoy yourself, be safe out there and make lots of fun projects. Thanks once again and everybody have a good evening. Appreciate it.